How wonderful to have the scriptures. Um, <clears throat> the last time uh, when I introduced this topic, I have it on my heart to speak about spiritual growth, progress. And we read the last time in Second Peter. And then we have seen Peter's desire was that the believers would grow. And we have seen at the end of the second epistle, Second Peter 3, almost the last verse, yeah, the last verse where he says, I'll read verse 17 also. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. That was Peter's testament. Peter was going to die. We've seen that in chapter 1 of Second Peter, that he anticipated to be killed. And he knew the time had come. When he was younger, the Lord said, when you will be old, then you will be led where you do not want to go. Mm-hmm. And we read it in John uh, 21. But now Peter knew that that time had come. And he was encouraging the believers not to appoint a next pope, Peter was not a pope at all, of course. But he did not say, now you have to organize yourself and get uh, everything uh, straightened out. He says, you straighten out yourself. And how do you do that? You saw that the last time in Second Peter 1. There are there are seven or eight points that we need to add. We start with faith. You saw that in Second Peter 1 the last time. And then he says, add to your face. And then we've seen there were seven points you need to add. So that is a challenge for all of us to be involved in that adding. Okay? So I don't, I don't, I'm not going to repeat what we said the last time. But it is so important because if we don't grow, then we become very vulnerable. And that was the verse in Second Peter 3, verse 17. There is all kind of wickedness, and we can be influenced. Another time I will talk about Ephesians 4, where Paul shows very clearly, if we are babes, we are very vulnerable. A babe needs to take in food, to be stronger. A babe needs to be disciplined. And when the children go up, sometimes they need a spanking. Even if it is not politically correct, they need a spanking sometimes. That's a biblical principle. You read it in Proverbs. Now, that's not the only thing. Then we have teaching. And the teaching is connected with this spiritual growth. So we need food, we need correction, we need training, and we need teaching. And this teaching Peter has given. And Peter did that uh, because he knew that his coming was, his departure was uh, coming soon. And he wants the believers to be diligent. I noticed that in Second Peter 1.10. Wherefore, the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure. This diligence is a key. And I hope another time I hope to speak about that. The diligence, this spiritual zeal is absolutely needed. We'll see that also in First Peter 2. This diligence is really a matter of love. Love for the Lord. Love for his word. This morning I was reading a book um, by a, a, a professor uh, teaching Hebrew. And he said in the preface that he thanked the Lord for his parents. His parents had taught him to love the word. Here we have the word of God. But we need this love to get into the word. We need this diligence to really get into the word and to grow, to become stronger. Because if we don't do that, we'll be easily swayed by the enemy. So, let's go back to what we read this afternoon in 1 Peter 2. And I'd like to connect that with 1 Peter 1. In 1 Peter 1, Peter introduces himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. So, you know, when the Lord Jesus was on this earth, he chose 12 apostles. That means he would send them out. They had special uh, authority given by the Lord to be his representatives. And so that is a wonderful 
point to see that Peter was one of those twelve sent out by the Lord on this earth. On the occasion in the Gospels we read that he, uh, the Lord Jesus, sent out seventy. And that was after the leadership of Israel had started to reject his ministry. They had considered what he was saying. They had examined what he was saying. And they disqualified him. We'll see more about this disqualify later. And then, what did the Lord Jesus do? He sent out 70 to represent him. 70 other disciples. So what does that mean? The leadership may reject the Messiah. But he is going on. His work is going on. And that is also true today, even in Israel. Of course, it's a, a remnant compared with the multitude of the so many million Jews, which is also a small number compared with the world population. But still, it's a tiny number of believers in Israel. And so it was in the days of Peter. There was a tiny number of believers who were followers of the Lord Jesus. And now he writes to those who had been scattered throughout the empire. Those days for the Roman Empire, Nero was reigning in those days, and there was even a persecution that had started. He writes to those who were living in northern Turkey. Those five regions that he mentioned are in Turkey. But he says what they are. They are elect. We did not read that, so I just draw your attention to that. First Peter 1 verse 2, they were elect, chosen. So the world may reject them, the Jewish leadership may reject them, as they had rejected the Messiah. They were also rejecting those early Christians. In fact, there was heavy persecution. Saul of Tarsus, he was persecuting those uh, early believers. You find it in Acts 9. But even Saul of Tarsus became a believer, because he belonged to one of those elect ones. He belonged to one of those chosen ones. And by the grace of God, all the believers today belong to the chosen ones. And that's not limited to the chosen people. God has now a different kind of people. He has not rejected his plans, his plans for uh, the earthly chosen people, but they are on hold. And in the meantime, God says, you know what? I have a chosen people. You read that also in the Old Testament, in Hosea. In Hosea, God said, you know, lo ami. This people has rejected me. They are serving the idols. I declare them lo ami. That is not my people. They are still Israelites. They are still Jews. But they have hardened themselves. And for the time being, God set them aside. He put his plans on hold. There are people who say that the church has replaced Israel. It's not true. God's plans for Israel will be uh, fulfilled. But for the time being, they are on hold. For the time being, it is low ami. But even though it is low ami, God still loves them. Even though it is low ruchama, that means not uh, no mercy to them. God couldn't show mercy to them because they rejected the Messiah. Still, he has them in his heart. So, they are elect, chosen, and according to the foreknowledge of God. Now, I want you to understand that. Here is a contrast with the Old Testament. When God chose Israel, it was from the beginning of the world. But when you study the New Testament, especially in Paul's writings, you see that this choosing, this election, goes from before the foundation of the world. You read Romans 8, 28. And other scriptures bear that out. That God had already a plan. It's mind-boggling. That God was thinking of you and me before the foundation of the world. That's the kind of election that he's talking about here. And so Peter was not only connected with the Lord as he was uh, having this ministry on this earth. Peter is now also connected with the rejected Messiah, who is the eternal son, who is God blessed over all. And you notice in verse 2, it's amazing to see the connection with the Trinity, the triune God. Of course, Jewish people today say that is not true. But even the Shema that we sang earlier implies the truth of the Trinity. It's a mystery. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, it's there from the, always. God is eternal. And so the triune God was always there. It's not an invention of the Catholic Church. This is what is in the Scriptures. And the Old Testament confirms it. In the Old Testament, it's not clearly revealed yet. But it's there. 
If you study the scriptures, you see the truth is there. And so my point is now here we see God who had chosen a people. That's the triune God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. This foreknowledge of God the Father. But then also it is it brings in the work of the Holy Spirit through sanctification of the Spirit. So that means God, the Holy Spirit, has set us aside as a people for himself. Not only for this time, but for eternity. And he connects us with the Lord Jesus. Yeshua HaMashiach, he sprinkled his own blood. We have been brought in a, in a in relationship that's marked by obedience. The Lord Jesus came, what did he say? I come to do your will, O God. Psalm 40, quoted in Hebrews 10. And he is the one who, who gave his own blood to introduce us into that relationship so that we also would be obeying God. The Lord Jesus was the only one who was always obedient. We were disobedient. Israel has been disobedient. But we have been introduced into a relationship marked by obedience. And that's important. But without the sprinkling of the blood, we would not have that uh, relationship. And having that relationship now, Peter says, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. And then there's an outburst of praise. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who ha according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again into a living hope or lively hope. We come back with the word lively later. But then it says, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So that is the foundation on which we stand. Without his death and resurrection, there would not be any redemption, would not be any salvation. And then he shows in verse 4, there is an inheritance that is planned. An inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away, reserved in heaven. So God has already something reserved for us in heaven. In the meantime, he says, in verse 6, you can rejoice in this, that is in front of you, that is before you, but now you're going through difficult times. Verse 6, heaviness, temptations, or that means trials. That's where we are. Now, in order to go through those trials, we need to be strengthened. That's why I talked earlier about the need of food, the need of training, the need of teaching, so that we may become stronger. And God is using now, it sounds strange perhaps, but God is using trials to make us grow. That's the point. We, he allows trials and difficulties to make us grow. It's amazing. And that shows how God is in control. When Israel was in Egypt, they had great difficulties. They were working hard. And then God set them free from Egyptian bondage and then they were in the wilderness. It's even more difficult. But they learned to rely on God, those who believed. And then when they were in the promised land, it's even more hard because now they had to fight those enemies. And, but my point is, God is in control and he leads his people throughout all these phases. And so he is leading you and me to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's an ongoing process. It will only end the moment of the rapture. In the meantime, we need to grow. And sometimes, you know, we are discouraged. We said, forget it. Or we think, oh, we are very proud of it. Oh, look at that. I've read the Bible ten times. I know this. I know that. And then you don't grow either. We need to grow by looking up to the Lord Jesus. So to come back to 1 Peter 1, <clears throat> it says in verse 8, We rejoice in him whom having not seen he loved. I mentioned earlier that love is really the key for spiritual growth. This diligence that Peter was talking about in 2 Peter, this diligence, this, diligence, this spiritual zeal is connected with love. And it's not connected with what is belonging to this a scene where you can see and feel and hear, he is now an invisible. But through faith we see him. And Peter says, although you not see him, you believe. And even that you rejoice. So they are in difficulties, they are in trials, persecutions, and what does verse 8 say? 
you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Verse 9, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. It's amazing what God can give even in a difficult time. And he strengthens us. He put before us his Messiah, the Lord Jesus, who is wonderful in God's eyes, now wonderful in our eyes. And he said, you know, you are going through these difficulties, but I'm keeping you. I'm protecting you. And what you're having there in heaven, the treasure that's in heaven, I'm protecting for you that too. And so God protects both ways. He protects the treasure we have in heaven, and he protects us while we go through this scene in view of the coming of the Lord Jesus. And then when you would study First Peter 1 uh, further, then you'll see the emphasis is on spiritual growth in different ways. But I just wanted to mention this, these beginning verses because they connect with chapter uh, 2 that we are talking about now. Uh, but it is what God is developing while we are here on this earth, going through difficulties, going through trials, and how he wants to draw us to the Lord Jesus. When you study chapter 1, you see God's school. God is teaching us. We are going through difficulties. God is teaching us. And when you go to chapter 2, we'll see that we suffer, not only because of trials, we suffer because God is training us through these sufferings. You remember what I said to the parents who are sometimes disciplining, have to discipline the children? God allows difficulties to test us. A difficult is, for example, your conscience. You suffer because of your conscience. You know you cannot do that. You cannot go with those Jewish friends because they deny the Messiah, and so you have to take a stand. And in chapter three, it's even worse. In chapter three, if you study First Peter, you see that you suffer because of righteousness. We are identified with the righteous one, and as long as we identify with him and uh, follow him, we suffer because of righteousness. And in chapter 4, we suffer because of his name, the name, the excellent name. And in chapter 5, you suffer because of the attacks of the enemy, the roaring lion. So this book is full of suffering. It's not very pleasant. But God is using these suffering. That's not the point. God is using these trials to make us stronger. Remember Daniel and his friends in the Old Testament? They were committed to God because that's this diligence that we were talking about, that initial commitment is absolutely needed. But when you see Daniel and his friends, they became strong in those trials and sufferings. They learned in those sufferings. And it's a wonderful example for us when you study the book of Daniel, how Daniel is an example for us going through difficult times and be faithful to the Lord at the same time. It's just one example. There are many examples that God uses trials to make us stronger. Now we go to chapter 2. But I want to connect it also with the importance of the Word of God. The Word of God is uh, very key in all this. Because without the Word of God, we will not grow. There are believers who um, listen to a sermon maybe once a week, and they think that's enough. We need to live with the Word. We need to cultivate our relationship with the Word. It's the living Word. And so this Word is essential for us, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. And I will come back to the Word in a moment, but it is... Uh, also connected with chapter 125, the last verse of chapter, 20, uh, chapter 1, verse 25, the word of the Lord endures forever. So, all flesh is as grass. You look at the man, Saddam Hussein, whew, pretty powerful. He's not longer there. Or you can think of other leaders in the past. We talked about Nero, a strong uh, potentate. He's not longer there. But what is remaining, the word of God. The word of the Lord endures forever. So, whatever changes here, we can rely on the word of God. And that is connected with the gospel that is presented to you in verse 25. The gospel was the good news that came to us. 
So the word of God abides forever. It endures forever. It is stable. It's like a solid rock. And it's also living. It's not just static. It's not just a piece. It is a living word. We'll talk about that. And that is connected with the gospel, the good news. The gospel is still going out today in many different ways. And so praise the Lord that this good news has reached us also. And I pray that everyone here has responded to that good news, the good news of uh, of God. God presents good news in a world where everything is falling apart, where everything is upside down, where people get killed left, right and center. In that world, God is presenting this good news. And now he goes to chapter 2. Now we have something to do. So everything depends on God. The word of God that endures. But now we look at the other side of the page. We have to do something. And what is that? Verse 1. Five things. And it is an ongoing exercise. The word laying aside implies or putting off. It's like something that, that's on you, but you have to put it off. And that you, that you do initially, the moment you're saved, you put off all that wickedness, the malice, the guile, the hypocrisy, I'll talk about that, the envies and all evil speaking. You put them all off. That's the moment you're saved. But it implies, this verse implies an ongoing exercise because the enemy knows that we still have the flesh in us. He knows that I have a tendency of lying. He knows that some of us have a tendency to be backbiters or a tendency for hypocrisy or a, a tendency for wrong lusts or evil speaking. Those tendencies are there. That's connected with the flesh. So what this verse is teaching us is the great need of self-judgment. So the moment we were saved, we have laid off that cloak. It's all gone. But now, what Peter is saying, you have to keep laying aside uh, in a practical way that nothing of that malice characterizes you, that nothing of hypocrisy characterizes you. See, this malice is really connected with talk. But of course, it's not limited to talk, because if you talk evil, it will also result in evil deeds. And here he says, all malice. So you may say, well, no, no, I have done a good job. I've, I've stopped lying. I've stopped swearing. I've... But it says, all malice. And also, all guile. The word guile means deceitfulness or uh, fraud. Even the word fraud is included in the word guile. So it's fooling it is showing something, but in reality it's not there. It's deceit. The Lord Jesus was marked by the opposite. There was never any guile in him. Never. And when he talked to Nathaniel, Nathaniel was one of those twelve disciples that he called in John 1. He said to him, there is one a true Israelite in whom there is no guile. But only in Isaiah 53 we read that in his mouth was no guile. The Lord Jesus never, never any word that was wrong came from his mouth. You could not say that of Nathaniel. And so even though Nathaniel was so close to God and had learned to judge himself, he is not as perfect as the Lord Jesus. But the Lord Jesus is always our perfect model. So the Lord Jesus did not have to lay aside these things. Because there was no guile in him or hypocrisy. But for us, we have to learn to lay aside these things because now we learn from a new master. The Lord Jesus is the new master. And we learn from him. And it implies that we are now exercised to lay aside all these things that are characterizing the old man, the flesh. This malice, this uh, wrong action, wrong words is connected with deceit or deceitfulness, fraud, fraud. It's also connected with hypocrisy. The, the word really means someone has a, a mask and he plays an act, like an actor. But he's not that person really. And so that is a characteristic of the flesh. The flesh wants to show off. 
You know who was good in that? The Pharisees. The Lord says, watch, beware for the leaven of the Pharisees. In Luke 12, verse 1. Uh, in Matthew 23, the Lord refers that too. Those religious leaders, they had a facade. They were serving God. They were honest. But in reality, it was the opposite. That is hypocrisy. So you show a mask, but the reality is different. That was the case with the Pharisee. And the Lord calls it even leaven, because it affects others also, that leaven. So hypocrisy is something that we have to learn to judge. Again, let's connect with self-judgment, so that we will be honest and not show off. In James 3, verse uh, eight, uh, 17, it says, The wisdom from above is first pure. The Lord Jesus is always pure. Then peaceful, gentle, full of mercy and good fruit, unwavering or without, uh, without party spirit, and then without hypocrisy. The Lord Jesus is just the opposite of what the Pharisees were. And also the opposite of the flesh in me. So I have to learn to judge the flesh so that I will not play just an act but that I'll be, I'll be true to the Lord and represent Him. And so that is also important to set aside envy. You know what happened with Joseph? Joseph's brothers were so envious that they sold him to Egypt. They were marked by envy. The leaders in, in Israel, the, the Jewish leaders, when Pilate had to do the law, the, he was the judge, he noticed that they had surrendered him or delivered him because of envy. They were envious. And so the Lord Jesus stood there before Pilate and Pilate realized he was there standing because of the envy of the Jewish leaders. And that's a terrible thing. Envy that will lead you in a wrong direction. Like Joseph's brothers, it had terrible consequences. They sold their own brother, yet God is overall, but that's God's side. God has allowed all these things. So don't think that now whatever happens, like with the Pharisees, that it can stop God. But we have our responsibility, and that's what I emphasize in this verse. And the fifth point is evil speaking. It is really speaking against someone. You remember the story of Moses, the most meek man in Numbers 12? Even his sister Miriam and his brother Aaron spoke against him. That is this uh, evil speaking. So these are five things, five is the number of responsibility, we have to lay aside. Once we did it in principle when we were saved, but now it's an ongoing exercise so that we will not be influenced by these things. So this is all negative. But it is important, because if we don't set these things aside, we cannot grow. You remember what we are talking about? We are talking about spiritual growth. God wants us to grow. And as long as we allow these hindrances to control us, we cannot grow. In order to grow, you need to be like a babe. Verse 2. That's not very pleasant. We don't want to be a babe. But the point is, there is something that characterizes this babe. It is desire for the pure milk of the world. That is what the point is here. So he doesn't want us to go back to babyhood. He doesn't want us to say, well, forget it. Your parents will take care of you. No, the point, the similarity is just this point. A babe has desire. And that is a strong desire. The word that's used here is really a strong desire. That is what a babe is marked by. And that's the point that he wants us to do. And this milk is also, the sincere milk is also from the same root. We talked about fraud in uh, verse 1 um, or guile. This milk is marked by the fact that it is without any guile without any fraud, without any cover-up. That is the characteristic of the milk. That is why it is pure. And it is uh, sometimes sincere, that goes together with their thought. 
So that is what the word is characterized by. You remember what I said, the word is enduring, it is forever. At the end of chapter 1, the word endures forever. That is the word that he's talking about here in verse 2. Because the sincere milk of the word comes from the logos, comes from that word. And it is something through which we will grow up. A babe, I said earlier, needs food. Here we see the milk that's given to the babe so that the babe will grow. So, now, he doesn't say by this verse, now you have to remain babes. You have to remain baby dependent on your mother all your life. That's not what he's saying here. The parallel that he's making here, as a babe desires, has a strong desire for the milk of the mother, so we need to have a desire for the milk, the milk of the word. That's the point. That's the parallel. The matter is strong desire, a craving for the word. That is what we want to be, just like a babe craves for the milk. But in other scriptures we see that God does not want us to remain a babe. So here we have the essential thing that is needed to grow. It is this desire. And then we will grow by, thereby because it says in verse 2 at the end, that ye may grow thereby. Remember what Peter had said? Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Here is where it starts. And that is an ongoing process till the end of your life. Even if you are 98 years old, you still should grow. And that is in view of salvation. It's not in the King James, but it is really in the text. Go up to salvation. So now we have this point. You remember I talked about spiritual growth. This word to grow up is used at least 21 times in the New Testament. It is a characteristic word in the New Testament so that we will grow. And that is an ongoing thing as I tried to explain. It is in phases, yes, but it is continuous. This growing process continues till the rapture. And it is connected with the word of God. It is through the word of God. In the power of the word of God that this growing takes place. It's not by all kind of tricks or uh, habits. Habit, a good habit is important, of course, to open the scriptures and read the scriptures. But the power comes from the word of God. And it is connected with the person of the Lord. That's verse 3. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious or good. This word gracious is sometimes translated differently. Good. Uh, Christos. It is uh, seven times in the New Testament. Another seven. And this is a characteristic of the Lord. The Lord is gracious. We see that in his earthly ministry here on this earth, how gracious he was even towards his enemies. But that doesn't mean that he would compromise. Never any compromise with the Lord. Although he is gracious, although he is so good, but the point is, we have to taste that now in verse 3. We have to take it in. How wonderful that we can taste these things and make it our own. We said earlier, it's so important to make the word your own. So it start by tasting, eating. It also connected with drinking. Often the word is connected with or uh, compared with wine. The wine that brings joy. And so you drink. Or the milk, you drink. So you see this growing process is connected with eating and drinking, spiritually speaking. And that Eating and drinking here is connected with love for the Lord. You have tasted that the Lord is gracious or the Lord is good. We are drawn to him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden. So we are drawn to him. That's the secret of spiritual growth. When Paul met the Lord in heaven, from that moment he started to grow. And he never forgot that he had seen the Lord in the glory. And he could talk about that, communicate that to others, and that is how he grew. And now for us, we need to follow Paul's example. 
to grow. And then there's also the response. And that's verse 4. So an initial response is you take it in. You accept the word <coughs> and you taste it, you eat it, you imbibe it. But then there's a further response. And that's in verse 4. To whom coming? So there's a further response. Now you uh, start to do something. You start to walk. Uh, in, there's a beautiful verse in uh, Song of Songs. I'll just read that. Song of Songs chapter 1. <coughs> Song of Song, the bride speaks about the beloved and says in verse 3, Thine ointments savor sweetly, uh, thy name is an ointment poured forth, therefore do the virgins love thee. And then verse 4, draw me, and then we will run after thee. So this drawing is the Lord is drawing us to himself, but we have to go. And that's the point here in 1 Peter 2, verse 4. To whom coming? He draws us, but then there is a response. We are going. Going for the gold. Going to respond to this drawing. And then when we, what do we meet in verse 4? A living stone. I want you to see that word living. Sometimes translated lively in 1 Peter. But the word living is found Seven times, just in First Peter, seven times. And here we have the living stone. So it's the living word. Here the Lord Jesus himself is a living stone. Everything that's connected with him is marked by life. Whereas the religious world is marked by, essentially by death. It is, uh, we talked about being drawn to him. We talked about coming to him. That's not static. But the religious system is static. There is no life in it. That's the contrast to what Peter is speaking about. And so a religious system becomes self-satisfied, uh, closed on its own. But here we have God's idea. God's idea is that we would take, that we would receive the Lord by faith, that he would be drawn to him, and that would lead to action. Although that's difficult because that stone was rejected. We'll talk about it in verse 5. But, or in verse 4 already. This allowed indeed of man. Now, for those who have the Old Testament with you, I just want to read to, uh, refer to Isaiah 28. This verse is really connected with a statement in Isaiah 28. Isaiah is the prince of the preachers. He's also the great evangelist in the Old Testament. And Isaiah speaks in many different ways about the Lord Jesus. The greatest prophecy, Isaiah 52, uh, 13 to the end of chapter 53. So he has also wonderful statements about the Lord Jesus. Here in Isaiah 28. And that's interesting that uh, God's judgment is going to come over a system that's marked by lies and falsehood. That's verse 15. Whereas God's foundation is marked by what is true. Verse 16. Verse 16 Therefore thus says the Lord Jehovah, Behold, I lay for foundation in Zion a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that trusts shall not make haste. Sometimes translated differently, but the point is, we see here what God is doing. He put their foundation in Zion. The leaders rejected him. You can connect it with Psalm 118. You make a note, you can read that later. Psalm 18 speaks about this stone also in Zion. So that is the foundation that God gave. Now, connect that with 1 Peter 2, uh, verse 4, disallowed by man. What man did, and that's also shown in Psalm 118, they rejected that stone. But God says, you know, this is a tried stone. It means he's passed the test. When God opened the heavens, he opened heavens and saw the Lord Jesus when he was about 30 years old. God had observed him, watched over him, a man on this earth for 30 years, and God 
said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. God tried that stone and approved it. It's a precious stone. But now, even on top of that, today, and you, you really need to read Psalm 118 also, we see that the Lord Jesus is now in heaven. The stone was rejected here on earth, and God says, I have a stone in heaven. He connects his building with a man with at God's right hand. And he has laid the foundation. Here is the cornerstone of the building. You need to need, read many scriptures in the New Testament to put that all together. He is the foundation. Paul says, no other foundation can be laid. 1 Corinthians 3. Jesus Christ is the foundation. But he's also the cornerstone. Verse 16. He puts, holds everything together. So he's the foundation. And sometimes uh, a house was built on a, on a slope. And so the foundation stone was really essential because without that foundation stone, you could not build anything. But then secondly, the cornerstone is also essential because the cornerstone keeps the house together. And then thirdly, it says, the sure foundation, we talked about the foundation already, but then in other scriptures we see that he's the top stone. Okay, in, in uh, Zechariah is a scripture. So there's a lot of homework, but in Zechariah is a scripture that says that he is the stone, and the builders uh, proclaim and speak well of that stone, also in Psalm 118. And the top stone is really also essential, because if the top stone is put on the building, it shows that everything is in order. If not, it will just fall down. So the Lord Jesus is the foundation stone. He's the stone that keeps everything together. He's the top stone that shows everything is in order. That's from God's perspective. But what did the builders do? They rejected him. They disallowed him. That's really, they disqualified him. They observed him, and he said no. They saw the signs that the Lord Jesus did, the Messiah. No, we don't want a Messiah like that. That is very tragic. They knew he is the Messiah. And yet they said, no. Terrible. That is what this word disallowed means. But chosen of God. God says, this is my man. God says, I want him. And God says, he is precious. The word precious is another key word. If you put the different forms together, you find it also seven times in Peter. And this is the stone who is marked by life. See, when the Lord Jesus talked to Peter in uh, Matthew 16, he talked about, who do men say that I am? And then Peter said, you are the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so that was Peter's confession. And then the Lord says on this Stone, I will build my assembly, or my church. My assembly is better uh, translation. The Lord is going to build on himself, not on Peter. Peter made a confession, but God's not. the Lord is not going to build on Peter. The Lord is going to build on himself. He is the stone. And that shows in resurrection. In resurrection, he shows that he is the living stone. That's why we read in 1 Peter 1 verse 3, we re read that earlier. Uh, in verse 3, who has begotten us again to a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from among the dead. He is a living stone. And so his resurrection shows how powerful he is. Now that's the living stone on which we are built, in verse 5, a spiritual house. In the Old Testament, they had the tabernacle, they had the, later on, they had the, uh, the temple of Solomon, then later on, the after the Babylonian captivity, the temple was rebuilt. That was the temple that uh, Herod beautified, and that was an imp imposing building when you saw that in those days. It was one of the world wonders. But then, that was not built on live living stone. We are the living stones that God is using to build a spiritual house. That is today. That is today. And you know, when, this did, when did that building start? In Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, when Peter could speak to those <coughs> Jewish, uh, the Jewish audience, 3,000 got saved. They also became living stones. 
they were now connected with the living stone. And that building of living stones will go on till the rapture. doesn't mean that God has no work to do after that. But, I mean, this particular building that we're talking about is also the assembly. What the Lord spoke about in Matthew 16, on this rock will I build my church, my assembly. Assembly means a company of called out ones. They were called from Judaism, like the sheep led out of the Jewish flock uh, or um, enclosure. So the Lord explained in John 10 that he was also going to call other sheep from elsewhere, that is, the, like me, a non-Jewish believer, and put them together in that one flock. Now here's, here is not a flock, here it is a spiritual house, but it's the same principle. He took from the Jewish people, he took from the Gentiles, different nations, and put them together as one. That is the word assembly that the Lord talked about in Matthew 16. That is a company that the Lord started building in Acts 2. And that is the spiritual house also. Because it's not only a building, those living stones, they form a building. That's you and me today, we form a building. But now it becomes complicated. We are also the house. What's going on inside the house is also called a house. Who was living in the Old Testament in the in the spirit in the house of God, it was the Levites, it was the descendants of Aaron, the priest. The priest could enter the tabernacle. Only the priests so, sorry, the Levites were the helpers of the priest. And so they were inside the house. So on the one hand they formed the priestly house and they were also inside that house as a uh, priestly company. And that's another point here in first Peter two verse five. Together as living stones we are the house built by living stones and built up. That's also uh, an ongoing process. But then inside that house there's a ministry going on. And that's why it's called a spiritual house. This is the people who live in that house. That is a priestly company who lives inside that house. So we are the stones, but we are also the company, the family that lives in that house a holy priesthood. See in verse 5, a holy priesthood. God contrasts that with the Old Testament priests. They were descendants of Aaron. But they were not necessarily holy. Here they, you find a holy priesthood set aside for God. And that priesthood, what is doing? Offer up spiritual sacrifices. In the Old Testament, uh, the priest could come but if you see it in, even in Luke 1, you find uh, Zechariah, he's there, chosen to do that special service, and there's no other priest who could do that. They were chosen by Lot. And so, there's another contrast. Now we are a plurality of priests. There's a priesthood, and they all we all can offer up spiritual sacrifices. You don't have to be um, ordained by man for that. This Priesthood implies all true believers who can offer up spiritual sacrifices. We talked about a response earlier. We uh, receive the word is a response. We run to the Lord. We come to him is a response. And he has another response. It is to offer up spiritual sacrifices. That is to present to God these spiritual sacrifices. Not a little sacrifice as you had in the Old Testament. Now it is a spiritual sacrifice. You see, there is tremendous contrast because between what was going on in the Old Testament and what is going on now. Tremendous contrast. So there are some parallels, the idea of a sacrifice, but the contrasts are greater. That's also what you have in Hebrews. And these sacrifices that we can bring up now as this priestly family are acceptable to God. Because they come through Jesus Christ. You see, the end of verse 5 is important. By or through Jesus Christ. That goes together with a uh, verse in Hebrews 13, verse 15. If you just keep that also, keep your finger at First Peter. But Hebrews 13, verse 15, speaks about this spiritual uh, sacrifice, spiritual priesthood. Hebrews 13, verse 15 says, By him, 
It's by the Lord Jesus. Therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. So there's an ongoing sacrifice, a priestly sacrifice going on. The fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. But it is through him. So that's now the point I'm trying to make in 1 Peter 2 verse 5. These sacrifices that we present, we present them by Jesus Christ. He is in heaven. He has given us his spirit who is in us. And in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can now bring those sacrifices to God. And it is through him, through the Lord Jesus. We cannot do anything without him. And if we come through him, then God is pleased. The word acceptable implies that God is pleased to receive those uh, sacrifices of praise. And then in verse 6 we find a contrast, wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. We mentioned Isaiah 28, we mentioned Psalm 18, 118, it's a quote from Psalm 118, and also from Isaiah 28, He that believes on him shall not be confounded or will not be uh, put to shame. So you put your trust in the Lord Jesus, and then God is not going to put you to shame. There may be others who will want to put you to shame, but this is a matter between you and God. And God says, I have laid that foundation. So God is going to fulfill his plans for Israel in Zion, here on this earth. He's going to build a new temple. You find it in Ezekiel 45 to 48. That's not what this verse is talking about. This is now the spiritual application for the day of grace in which we live. And so God says there is this chief cornerstone. He's chosen, elect. He's precious. And now on our side, we believe on him. And then we are not put to shame. And there we find then a contrast also between the generation that was there, marked by disobedience in verse 7, so for us who believe, he is precious. And I don't want to limit that only to Jewish believers. This is also for us Gentile believers. He is precious. But then the, those who have rejected him are the disobedient. But it's not only among the Jewish people. There are also religious people today who have rejected the Lord Jesus. They may call themselves Christians. They may have elaborate systems of worship, but as long as they are not born again, as long as they not truly belong to the Lord, they belong also to the disobedient and those who disqualify the true uh, building. So this is very solemn. It really tests man's work, whether it is from the perspective of the Jewish people or people who imitate in the history of the church. There's a lot of imitation going on. And they reject the true builder, but God has made him the head of the corner. We talked about that in Isaiah 28. So everything depends on him. Whatever man does, God's plans cannot be disturbed. But there's a consequence. If you reject him, verse 8, the stone of stumbling and rock of offense. So those who rejected him, they stumbled over him. They came to fall. We find that with the Jewish people in the days of the Lord Jesus, and that also happens even today, that people stumble over him. They don't want a Messiah like that. A rock of offense. But then we see also in other scriptures, also in uh, Isaiah, that then the stone will fall on them. The judgment of God will come on them. And they are appointed to that. Verse, the end of verse 8. But, verse 9, ye are a chosen generation. So now we'll go back to the true believers and we'll close this that what we are now by the grace of God we belong to the chosen ones <clears throat> and I repeat that's not in connection with God's plans for this earth uh, Abraham and his descendants chosen for this earth but this is now true for all believers not only for the Jewish believers it applies also to all the true believers today we are a chosen generation a royal priesthood. This royal priesthood means we represent the king. So the priest, the Lord Jesus is the great priest, he has many priests. The Lord Jesus is the king, he has many kings. We find it in Revelation. And we 
belong to him, the great priest, we belong to him, the great king. And we represent him in this scene. That's not the point. We are a royal priesthood. What does it say? A holy nation, a peculiar people, that he should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness to his marvelous light. Of course, that imply, applies first to Jewish believers, but there is an application, I believe, to all true believers. We are now all belonging to a chosen people. We are all belonging to this royal priesthood. We all are called out of darkness to his marvelous light. This marvelous light is connected with God who is wonderful. His name is wonderful. We had it earlier, a quote from Isaiah. He is wonderful. And so he is living in a wonderful light and he has called us out of darkness to that wonderful light. This call is very powerful. Peter speaks about the call seven times. And God called us out of darkness. Now who can do that? To be delivered from the power of darkness. It takes action. And God is so strong that through his call, he delivers us from the power of darkness. Abraham is an example of that. Abraham was in darkness. He was serving the idols. Uh, Joshua 24 speaks about that very clearly. He was an idol idolater. And God called him out of that darkness. So that happened to Abraham, the father of all believers. And so by the grace of God, you and I, we have been called out of this darkness to present his praises, to show forth the praises of him who has called you. And so now we are also a testimony to this world. First of all, we are a priestly family to bring praise and sacrifices of praise to God, verse 5. And now God says, now I want you also to be my witnesses. The royal priesthood means you represent the king. The Lord Jesus, the rejected Messiah, he is the true king. And this royal priesthood represents him in this world where he is still rejected. We show forth the praise of him who has called you. How wonderful. So we'll close with this. That's all connected with this spiritual growth that they were talking about. God wants a response. And if we give that response, he will also make sure that we become stronger and stronger and stronger. So another time, Lord willing, we'll talk about other scriptures connected with spiritual growth. But the Lord wants us to be encouraged, to be strengthened in him and keep growing. Don't stop growing. Okay? May the Lord bless his word. Amen. Amen.